Hey Dude, The 90s Call, with Christine Taylor and David Lasher. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Hey Dude, The 90s Called. I am one of your co-hosts, Christine. I'm your other co-host, David. Hi, David. What's up? How are you? I'm good. Did Casey go to school yet? Where are we at? What's we go the tomorrow, countdown? tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. <gasps> yeah. Oh, I'm, I know. I'm I'm nervous. I'm excited. I, it's it's it'll be so great. It'll be so great. Big deal. Yeah. I you know, Casey's one of those kids who enjoyed his high school experience way more than I did. You know, oh like Oh my gosh, he's he one of those. Is clinging to his fr- I mean, he was at, in Malibu at the beach till midnight last night. I'm like, dude, you know, you gotta, we gotta start packing. Right. You're gonna have to leave at some point. And, right. You know, but he's excited. I mean, and it's 105 degrees in Austin. So, oh, gorgeous. Look It'll at- be a beautiful move in, <laughs> a beautiful dorm move in. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's really exciting. Yeah. Ella was just saying um, the other day, she's getting ready to start her final year of college. And she said, I'm finally there. I- I'm getting to that place where I wanted to be since I was six years old, not in school anymore. <laughs> she <laughs> was never a kid who liked journey. school. She just did never loved school. I mean, had got had great friends, but did not love the high school experience. I did not. We had a very sort of a traditional you and I right. high school experience. We only had part of it, really. But I, I was the same. But Casey, oh, God love him. It's going to be great. Yeah. And how's Quinn? What's he up to? He's good. He's good. He's he's going to be getting his wisdom teeth out in about a week and a half. So he's oh, sort of fun. trying to en- enjoy his freedom until and then, you know, it's all the end of summer, the like summer reading and all of that stuff, which has been, um, you know, put on the back burner. Everyone gives up on summer in mid-August and it really <laughs> bothers me. I, me too. Right. Me too. Like it's always after Labor Day. Let's start talking about the end of summer. Yeah. We're still in it. We're in it. We're in it. We'll enjoy it. Um, And all right. And the fact that we get to still do our podcast over the summer and get to um, connect, meet, reconnect with so many incredible guests. Our guest today, who is in the waiting room. Yeah, I'm excited. Someone I worked with back in the 90s. Um, We worked on a, a cult classic film together and you know i'm gonna ask her how she feels if she wants to mention the films by name that she's been in or i mean i think everyone has different feelings about that um with the strike but um anyway let's let's bring her in she's she is so so good she is so good in this movie we're in her name is rachel true and i cannot wait to see her (laughs) it's been too many years i'm excited i just watched some well i'm not gonna name movies i just watched another clip of a movie she did she's so freaking funny let's say a big hello to my long lost friend rachel true <laughs> thank it's you so much right. for having me on your podcast you guys thank you so much for doing this like thank you first this of is all, awesome we you know we're in this strike and we've been continuing our podcast because we are a 90s podcast so we're really looking back we no nobody that we have coming on has really been promoting anything they're doing now we're we're really trying to look back on what that era was for all of us you know <laughs> of when we were all starting out or or you know in, in some cases But Christine cases, did you know we were in a moment cuz I don't think Pete, you realize you're in a moment until the moment is gone Z- no, no, that, I had no. Is that a re- song? Re- That's a song. <laughs> Maybe that- it is, but like I think I keep telling the kids today, like when I meet an eighteen or twenty year old and they're so fun, I'm like, you're in a moment, right? It doesn't last, so you know, enjoy Be it. Be here now. Yes. Be here now, like Ram Dass says. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that because I first of all I want to hear uh, you, you know I know this is always boring stories for the for the person telling them, but like how it all began because then I want to get into that moment in time where we all worked together and my whole experience on that movie was with you so we we'll talk about that but talk let's talk about you're a New York City girl yes yes my stepmom is an actress a theater actress who did stuff with James Earl Jones and all these big theater people so I were and listen, we her and I get along amazingly now, but um I was in foster care from zero to four, which most people are like, you were to the manor born. And I'm like, think think whatever you want. But so anyway, at four, I went to live with my dad and my my stepmother and 
I we get her and I get along amazing now, but we didn't back then. And then I saw her on stage. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, my God. You could be anyone you want. You could be anything. Not that I've ever really done stage, by the way. I was a film girl. <laughs> First thing I have. I some right. movie. But it caught your attention. <laughs> yeah, well, just that, that you could be, you could embody whatever you wanted and all these different sides of your personality, whether it was really what was happening with you. So I kind of fell in love with it that way. But I was, I'm actually very, um, I'm like an extroverted introvert. So as a child, I was very introverted, very quiet. And I remember saying around eight, I want to be an actress. And everyone was like, ha, 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 you'll never do it. You're too shy. So, you know, I'm a Scorpio. I was like, oh, really? Oh, really? Watch me. <laughs> Don't you dare tell me I'm not going to do something, right? <laughs> In fact, it's, it was very motivating to me when I was young. And I'm actually been dissecting that as I get older, because I don't really need strife to motivate me. I don't want strife to motivate me as an adult, if that makes any sense. But as a kid, I was like, oh, really? You said no. That's the only reason I ended up in the craft. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> so I, I was in New York City. Um, you know, I was bartending at this place called Caliente Cab, which some old people know. And uh, I started doing commercials. I booked the first one I ever went out on. And then it was a Super Bowl commercial. And whoa, I didn't whoa, know. whoa, whoa. Back up. Your <laughs> first I audition. I didn't anything. I was just like, oh, yeah, it was my commercial. So... That's how I got that. Then I got, um, long story short, I was coaching these kids on a pilot. It was a Raven Simone pilot. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd actually done stand and work on The Cosby Show. I write some essays about that on my book because I saw a lot of things. Anyway, from that job, I was coaching to Raven Simone and the other little boy on uh, Saturday Night Live stage. And Chris Rock came by. So his first impression of me is like this maternal woman with these kids, which I, I love kids. But I was like, you know, a focused actress. So I think he had this impression that I was like this, you know, church going children. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm a hippie. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> but, I, but I ended up in his movie CB4. So that's what brought brought and when I'm tired, my New York accent comes out. Oh, of I love it. No, I love it. <laughs> we got the new we, we have the New York accents, too. <laughs> but you know, what? that's the nice thing about being a grown up. You're like, it is what it is. So um, I got that Chris Rock movie CB4, which I did have to audition for like three times. And that moved me out here. And that was gotcha. about two years before the craft. So and, and then just to say about the craft, my TV broke nine months before that script landed on my doorstep. And um, I was like, I'm going to fix my TV. I'm American. I love television, even though I only had four channels. And then this little voice came in and said, don't fix your TV. <laughs> You're supposed to be doing something else. And then I really I had always done tarot cards and things like that. So I really delved into that. And then these two guys show up nine months later. They're like, oh, it's just a wire. And they fixed my TV. And then the script showed up a week later. So it was almost like the universe forced me to prep for the movie I didn't know was coming. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And also like that particular movie, which is so <laughs> crazy too, right? When you said yeah. you were like to sort of be one with the universe, to be in, to, to, if you were into tarot card, like how that movie was the one that willed its way into your life somehow, and, right? And then you willed your way into it, right? I, I did. But since I was eight years old, I was into all that. Like when I was four, like I said, I moved back in, in with my dad. And he had a, what I call the library, which was a bookshelf. But I would pull down <laughs> Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil and a Young's Man and His Symbols. I've been taught to read at like four or five. So I probably a couple words, but really it was the images, right? And so then cut to a few years later, someone shows me a tarot deck and I'm like, oh, my God, it's the same images. It's literally the same images from the young book. This is a language I can learn to understand. And again, I'll, not to belabor it, but, you know, tarot is always used for self-soothing. Right. Much more than like the future. I'm like a neurotic actor. <laughs> <laughs> a New York. A New York. A New York. You're, I'm like you're old... reading Nietzsche and Carl Jung as a child. That's pretty special. <laughs> I did have, you know, I'm, I feel lucky that my dad was, uh, who's passed now, but he was like an intellectual Jewish man. So we were introduced to lots of concepts and then, you know, having an actress, uh, stepmother with all the arts and theater. It's really a lovely artistic upbringing. That's that's wonderful. Like to have, I mean, and also to connect the dots at eight years old to have sort of looked at those images and then see see the deck of tarot cards and 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 put those pieces together and and 
by the way, at that age, self-soothing, self-care, like well, the, no, those I'm are things. Say this. I didn't understand it was self-soothing, self-care then. As I've gotten older, then I understood what I was doing with it. Do you know what That's I'm saying? Interesting. Like, yeah. I wasn't cognizant enough to know, oh, I'm self-soothing. I knew right. like this makes me feel better or worse. Now, as an adult who writes books, as well as other things, I get it now. And I think that I, most of us were not taught really how to self-soothe, unless you had amazing parents, which some of us did. But most of us, our parents were tired and working and this and that. And so we were sort of left alone with our little feelings. Right. And we we grew up in that era where our parents were not helicoptering the oh way <laughs> parents, Some? myself included, like, to, you know, we're all so involved in our kids' lives now that my parents, I mean, they, they loved me. They g- gave me opportunities. They put me in the school play, like all the things that I, but it was sort of like, yeah, sure. Go, go do your thing. <laughs> no, or, if, or if you're interested in camp, research it. Let us know. You, it wasn't like they were doing all the work. That's us. actually true. Like, and I, as a New York City kid, which we moved away when I was like 11, 12 and went upstate. But as a city kid, I remember going to the, I used to love to go to the library. You know, it was my safe space, just the library and books. And I would read a book a day. They didn't believe me. The teachers, they tested me on comprehension. I, I got a hundred. So the library was just my place. And I remember leaving at like 7 a.m. to go walk, you know, mile, uh, like, you know, blocks away to go to the library. And I came back at 10 and my parents were just getting up and they were like, where, what, where were you? And I was like, the library. And they were like, okay. There was no, <laughs> no sure, one noticed. Sure you were. <laughs> yeah, nobody noticed I wasn't home. Nobody. <laughs> right, right. You did your thing. Yeah, it was, it was a different time. I think in some ways it was kind of great. In some ways it was kind of terrible. We, we know that, right? Like there's so many uh, things that today's generation has an awareness of yes. emotional health and physical health. And, and I don't think parent, like, I don't, are you probably, neither one of you probably got hit, but I did. And it, you know, it definitely made me skittish, like as an adult. And, and that's, I don't, I'm not trying to disparage my parents. I'm just saying they were boomers, you know. Oh, uh, are, you, are you kidding? No, I, I mean, I, I talk openly about the fact you, that it was my parents also, because I also grew up Catholic. They weren't uh, super, super religious, but it was conservative, Catholic. It was Catholic school, it, you know, and, and a lot back then and in my family in particular, my parents didn't have the skill set to know how to talk about difficult things. So, right. it, you know, let's say let, there something ha- happened with someone in the family. It was sort of like, oh, there's something going on. And, and then it just kind of got swept under the oh, rug a little we bit. We don't it talk was, about it. So that's we don't really want to talk about it because it's There's uncomfortable. A- I don't, we don't, or, you know, what I think the other thing sometimes is parents want to protect you from something that's might be scary or uncomfortable. So they just don't talk about it. And and that's doing such a disservice, like by not talking about it, by not living in reality on what the tough stuff is. I agree. Or, or like filling in the blanks, because I remember once we moved to upstate New York, I wouldn't call it fun. And then, you know, as I got older, too, and maybe this was my choice, or I think it's partially the patois of my voice, right? Because I'm not I'm northern. I don't have a southern accent so when i hit town in the 90s i was like i just want i rarely hear people speak like i do so i want to use this patois so then i ended up being the only brown girl on every movie i was (laughs) so (laughs) it's been a theme in my life and it's not necessarily good or bad it just is does that make sense yeah Yeah. i want to hear about your audition process because i know it was not originally written it was all white girls right it, yeah, it, she in was the original like, script. My character was bulimic to begin with. She was okay. Anglo and bulimic. But I do know a friend of mine, Jordan Ladd, who's an actress. We had done a Gregor Rocky movie together. Yes. She said, there's this movie floating around. You got to read for it. So she's the one who told me about it. So then I take it to my agents and I'm like, hey, just witches. And uh, <laughs> they're like, you're too old. And I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm Wait, very how, how old were you when? How old? old? I was like 27. 20. I was old. I was older That's, than everyone, but I don't even think I look, looked it, the old. You did not look the oldest. It you doesn't looked seem ex- old now, we does all it? Looked at, we were all in our 20s, we though. All, we all looked exactly this. I feel like we all looked. Yeah, everybody everybody looked great, by the way. But um, so they, my agent literally refused to submit me for it. And I was like, so then uh, Jordan's manager had been wanting to work with me. And I was like, fine, manager. I didn't want to pay an extra 10%. But you know what? If you can get me in on this thing. <laughs> she did. She made one phone call, got me in. 
Right. Right. So that was a lesson in teamwork as far as the team we've assembled. And then they were surprised that I left them. Uh, the agents. I was like, you didn't even want to submit me. <laughs> you, you couldn't get me in on that audition. But that was a movie I remember because we we talk about this a lot in the 90s. David, you were in in, you know, a movie that was like the big movie that all the guys wanted to be in. I remember for us, it was like all, all the girls were auditioning for that movie. And I right. I I, te- I screen tested for Robin's <gasps> part. You, you know, you, yes. Yeah, and that's- I'm yeah. not surprised. Yeah. And and Andy was he was so great with me. And he just was like, I, I'm I just love, you know, my my sister and I grew up watching Marsha. Like, you're so much. I want to find something for you in this movie. And Wait, so I, this I, is post Brady Bunch. This was. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. But it so. So, yes. Yeah, so this this role, my entire like Laura Lizzie is the character name. <laughs> and it is like. All she does is torment Rachel's character. She is, she is a little one note. Just to, not your performance, but I mean, the, the dialogue little, is literally like. A little? <laughs> just like, I'm racist. I'm I mean, still racist. First of all, Laura and Lizzie are two first names and they couldn't be more white bread first <laughs> I names. I know. I know. Laura Lizzie was, and an, I mean, put on this earth to torment this poor Rochelle in the movie. And we're, we're on a diving team together. And, and the, even the things like where you would have to be doing a dive or your character. And I would just yell shark in the middle of the dive. Like yeah. she was the ultimate bully, <laughs> racist yeah. bully. Yes. Um, and, we had these, I mean, it, some of the dialogue, and I'm not going to repeat the dialogue. It was just... So this movie would not get made today, for sure. No, but here's the thing. In some ways, uh, listen, it could get made today. It's still very timely, Davis. Well, it sure is. <laughs> One of the things that I actually appreciate about that movie now that I didn't vet was um, that's real. Like, the, the crap really did capture the anger and angst of the 90s. Right, Christine, don't you agree with that? So much, so much. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, it, in, it, obviously it's a, about witches and it was a bit exaggerated, but it really also <laughs> captured that awful high school, the meanness, the, the clicks, the, yeah. the who's left out and the, the, the people that would talk behind other people's back. I mean, it really covered so much of that. It was it, it very, very timely. Like, I, I, I really feel, and I just remember us shooting that scene together. And I, I think, I think after every take, I just would go, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Cause it would, <laughs> and he would so just hard. say, he's like, just do it meaner. Just do it meaner. And just she do it, so just do lovely. it so throw away. Just do it so How throw away. How would someone like, cast you? As the mean girl, I, that's beyond <laughs> my uh, belief. But that was part of what was fun about playing it, and then also like the 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 great part about the movie is then the witches, the 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 coven puts a spell on me. I get mine. I get mine. It's she gets hers. Right. You know that walking shot in the craft. I was yep. literally always stuck in the back. Cut to the walking shoot. They put me in front, and I'm like, why am I in front? And it's with the my nipples going it's everywhere. Bo- know. That, like, that oh. whole shot is everybody's boobs. <laughs> it's really, yeah. it's like a slow motion. I mean, the the pitch is for hot witches, right? So they gotta <laughs> they gotta market this. So. I'm just saying, but it took me 20 years to be like, oh, that's why they put me in the front in that one right. scene. But um, I think my issue with it back then, to be honest, with okay, so Bonnie uh, Nev's character is burned. Um, Robbins is, uh, Sarah, is that her name? Right, right. You know, she had suicidal thoughts. Um, Feruza was just, you know, probably bipolar and, and four, you know, that was her, her character's thing. And mine was what I'm black. What is my problem? Other than I don't like racists. Right. That you just have a bully. Right. Yeah. You just so have I, this bully I was, I, racist. Right. And and if you notice, everyone else has parents. I don't. We shot a scene with my parents and they were like, please let them tell them to give us a line. I was like, I'm trying to keep my lines, lady. <laughs> and that scene, was, <laughs> that scene was cut. So I'm not bringing these things up to go, isn't that so? Look, what, all right. No, because I don't feel like bitter about it. I'm just saying that is the difference in time. You know, that is the difference in now to then and the awareness that we have. Because one thing, I'm not salty about it, but I'm like, I, 
I remember when after the movie came out and it had done okay. It wasn't a huge hit, but it did okay. Right. And all other three girls were invited to the MTV Movie Awards, right? And I wasn't invited. And I remember saying, "Hey, girl," to my cast members, and uh, you know, I'm I'm bummed about that. And they were like, "Well, it's because we're all famous." And I said to that person, "How do you get famous? You get invited to the award shows and you get photographed." Back then, compared to now, when you can just set up a YouTube channel or a TikTok, right? So if I'm not invited, and not just that, I wasn't invited on the publicity junket. Are you? I, I was excluded. Kidding me? I'm not kidding you. Now, if you do not think that affected my career financially and work wise, you're crazy because it did. You know. So I think things like that, I'm super glad things have changed since then. Cause that would never happen. Can you imagine putting out a movie with four girls on the poster and being like, we don't think it's going to play in black areas. So we're not going to include you on the junket. So I think, like, you know. That sounds like, insane. That David, sounds insane. Not fun. No. Right. Not so not, much fun. Not fun, but you didn't yeah. let it stop you. I mean, so, so, so tell, so t talk me through, like, talk us through how that, you, like you said, you don't want to use, you, you don't want to use any more strife to motivate you. Right. But yeah, 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 back yeah. then, yeah. was that like, watch out, that, I'm going to, cause you, cause you're so good. And I, there's no version of that movie where I don't think of it as the four of you. It is a full that it's that ensemble. I don't look at it. I, I mean, I Robin's agree. character is sort of the star who's coming in and she's well, be, you know, but when the movie gets going, it's the four of you and it's playing out all those storylines. Well, I think what it is, what you here, here's the thing. And then I want to get back to some of the stuff with working with you, but I think what it is and what I say to some of my friends at, the, at this point in my life is when they're really bummed about something and I get it, like, listen, I love to, you know, dig into my pain too. But after a while, I'm like, listen, you got to think like a black person, which is what you said. I can't, you, I got a no. Well, then I have to figure out the other way around it. Oh, mm -hmm. I heard another no. Instead of going, they said no, you know, you can't just throw up your hands. I've got to, I've got to go. Okay. Um, just like I picked up the manager to get the audition and that cost mm -hmm. me 10 more percent of my money. Right. But mm -hmm. it was worth it. So it's, it's just figuring out how to do it. And again, things are much more different now. So I do feel like there's validity in these stories from the, my Gen X days as, as a 90s actor in what I dealt with because I want, that's just part of history. And there's a lot of people who paved the way for me to be able to be in the craft, right? And so hopefully right. I've paved the way in my little tiny way for some weird, quirky, alternative black chicks. You know what I mean? <laughs> to do their thing. But that said, like once, once I got the job, Gosh, I don't want to make it all about this, but maybe it's because I'm working on a second book, right? It's just essays. And so it's a lot of this stuff is on my mind. And um, I had someone say, well, you, it's all about race for you. And I said, yes. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. I, I don't No, I don't think it's just you. I mean, uh, we had a, another friend of Christine's on uh, Marin Dungy. Oh, I know uh, Marin. Yeah, yeah. The other day. So and I, we were talking about how the business had changed. And I was asking her, what are the biggest changes that she's seen? Because I, I wanted to talk about streaming and uh, the strike and the loss of residuals. She said the biggest change is more opportunity for people of color. Absolutely. That was her answer. And I was like, whoa, yeah. I mean, right, if there's any you, positive. Right. And you probably wouldn't even think that. But I get why she said that. I will say this. The thing about the 90s, though, as far as work is I I lived on residuals. Like I was just saying to someone, I don't know yeah. that I, I, Rachel, would have been able to afford to be an actor in today's world, you know, because I didn't have the help of. I have family help, which is great. I don't begrudge anyone. I'm like, yay for you that you have some subsidy, right? To help yeah. you with a artistic career. But if I was just starting now, I think I would be really overwhelmed. And I'd be like, oh my God, do I really have to pay $200 to audition between this and, you know, going to a place? And no, you don't, you know, and all of, there's ways to work around all that. But it just seems a lot. Am I wrong that it seems more daunting now? Or is that just my opinion? It's I mean, it feels very daunting now. I think our, our peers are trying to correct that right now as we speak. And and I think it will be. But Marin's answer was to your point that there are some positive changes that have occurred. Right. Uh, 
And her answer threw me because I wasn't thinking, I was trying to go to, towards the negative and talk about the strike. But she said, you know, there's more opportunity now. There, there absolutely is. Cause I was on a sitcom in the early aughts, right? And um, it was on UPN on Black Night. And I was like, I just want to be on a night. <laughs> but in the end, I'm like, you know what? It's fine that there was Black Night because that way people got to see a, a night of themselves, right? But it wasn't in, in interspersed in. Like, so you guys might not know that, but in the 90s, there was only one drama one called Under One Roof. James Earl Jones was on it and my co-star Essence Atkins. Um, oh, one I, I love Essence. Yeah, oh my God. she's a great girl. Yeah. Said. Um, I've worked with her in a bunch of different things. And uh, so that was it in the 90s. That's how small, you know, the the opportunity in the pool was. So, yes, it's changed so much. I'm so excited for the changes that have come. I would say it's so interesting to watch Gen Z go. It's all me, though. And if I want to go into this audition for, a, you know, a senator with green hair, I can. And I'm like, good luck. You know, like, <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that. Because there's still <laughs> rules and things and 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 boxes, right? We're, we're in as actor archetypes, all those things. And I was like, yes, you can do it your way. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think in the 90s, it felt like you had to get in the system to then change it. Mm -hmm. Now it feels like they can make their own system. So that's mm. so exciting for people today. Uh, you guys continue about your movie and working together because I have to get to one stoner movie with Dave Chappelle, but you guys finish <laughs> up what you're doing and then no, I will get. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I actually wish like, you know, um, we actually could have hung out. It's talked a little more, right? Because we're on set. She's saying these terrible things. She's obviously the nicest girl. She's so sweet. I'm like, hey, dude, all these. She literally <laughs> is genuinely me. the sweetest person any of us know. It it was. It, I felt it was a. It was a. Again, it, we we talk a lot on this podcast about come because we we've all done the guest star roles on sitcoms and that and and it, you know the, that movie I would only come in for certain days and certain chunks of time and most of almost all of my, I think I might've had a day or two that was not with you, but I, it, I always felt like that little bit of the outsider. And then on top oh, of it, I'm playing the character that I was playing. Did but, you? Yes. A little bit. I mean, just really, just not wanting to, you know what I mean? When, when there's a rhythm and the, everyone oh, knows the yeah, crew. I do. I do. Also, but what non-actors might not know is sometimes when you're a guest, not she was a cast, not a guest, but I mean, on right. TV shows, when you guest, you just don't know. The cast could speak to you or not. No, and and Thanks. you you were all great, and that was the thing. And 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 Andy was also delightful. I mean, with me and, and Andy's just, the the director. Yes, yeah. Andy Fleming, Christine. Do you know this? Story? So the night before I tested, Andy Fleming, we're on the phone, and I'm like, because I'm so you know neurotic. <laughs> and he goes, Rachel, just don't drool, and the part is yours. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> really? And oh. I, I felt good. I hang up. No, I hang up, and I'm like. I'm not drool. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's his way of telling you you have the part. Just go in and I be know. you. Yeah, that's I love that. My last little Andy story before we get to half baked is um. So Andy, so Andy Fleming. I was a freshman uh, at NYU when Andy Fleming was like a super senior living in the other side of the same dorm, Weinstein at NYU. You, no, you were at in Weinstein. Yes, I, <laughs> how do you know that? Is your kid I no. know it because my daughter did a, a summer program there and, and it's it's the infamous it's the Weinstein. worst dorm ever. Uh, horrendous. But didn't it's the Beastie prison. Boys start there and, and, and Adam Sandler? Oh, I, and I mean, it was no. just, it's One it's morning famous, we no? get woken up by the loudest music and I look out and it's the Beastie Boys filming their video because Rick Rubin was still exactly, in the Exactly, exactly. No, it was Rick. a fun drive. Anyway, so I didn't really, I didn't know Andy. I was the shyest. You wouldn't have even recognized me back then. But my roommate dated Andy's roommate. So this guy had come, you know, to my dorm room. Refused. So anyway, I'm auditioning. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I hope Andy doesn't, you know, can remember me. I look so different. And, <laughs> and so he doesn't. But, and so then cut to her on set. And the roommate that my roommate dated comes to set. And he's staring at me no. and I ran and hid in my trailer the entire rest of the day when I wasn't working. So I'm like, I can't have this guy telling him I'm 
6,000 years old. I can't have this right now. <laughs> we, were, we were all playing seniors in or what high school. I don't even know what year in high school we were, were supposed to be. High school. Yeah, we, we, we were, were definitely in high school for we sure. Were. <laughs> yeah, we, well, were we were in high school. We but were we super were not. seniors. <laughs> anyway, so I do really appreciate that movie so much because I was interested in the subject matter. I always say to people now, like, I think it came to me because I just sort of, I was truly into it. Um, and it's fun. It's a, there was a long time I never wanted to talk about it. I was like, who, who cares? But now that it's all this time later and I do some conventions and I see yeah. how much it means. Like I did one in California recently. So it's a lot of um, very mixed crowd. It was really nice to see like Spanish and Anglo and, and black people. And the amount of young 16, 17 year old girls, they're so young. And I'm like, your mom made you watch it. And they're like, no, but I loved your character, your character, your character, because right. I related. So that actually does mean something. I, it does mean something. And and like you said, the movie came, it, it was a moment in time that we, I think we all thought we were working on something really fun and cool. It didn't do great, but yeah, it yeah. is one of those films that has lived on in a way, like it, it, almost beyond cult following, because like you said, a new generation and, and I never saw the remake. I don't even know if it was remotely close. To- I don't know her. Nice gowns. <laughs> I didn't even. <laughs> no, not here's my thing. They actually spoke with us all about being in it, and then they yeah. literally for months, and then they were like, "We don't think the audience wants to see you in it, you guys." And I was like, "Good <laughs> luck with that." Right. So I haven't seen it either. Yeah, yeah. All right, Wait, we'll stay in the solidarity. Movie, the movie wasn't a hit when it came out. No, no. It, like, listen, it was That's number surprising, one. That's surprising because I, I the, everyone was t- talking about that movie. No, it was number one technically for a week until right. Mission Impossible or so. I think we beat, we did beat, we beat Barbed Wire for the record. Okay. All right. Good for us. <laughs> yeah. I remember the premiere. I remember, I mean, it was cool. To, it was a cool thing to be a part of. Okay, I was, I like, loved it. But the other thing people listening might not get, I think part of my nostalgia and appreciation for that is that we shot it on film. You know, it was like film, oh, yeah. film, film. Like I had a real screen test, like a real same screen. Yeah, like it, it was the the last hurrah, really, to those kind of movies. Not that it was a big budget, um, but it was fun. And and the thing is, when you're on set and you're shooting film and they say, you know, uh, rolling and action, you know that it's expensive. You know that film matters. Oh, yeah. Every you take. Know, like, yeah. Yeah. Not like now where it's like, we got a million digital sticks, which is fine. Uh, we have to progress. I'm not against that. I actually yeah. am hoping a indie revolution will still come out of all this. It hasn't happened yet. Yeah. But I'm hoping it will. Yeah. No, we did. We you felt valued. You felt like it was important. You're absolutely right. It really yeah. was a, that we talk we talk a lot about those that period of time of that sort of dying breed. Yeah. Oh, but and lastly on the craft, a fair number of actresses came up to me over the years back then, at least well, still even. They'll be like, I didn't, you know, and they'll be um black actresses and they're like, I didn't audition for the craft because the devil. And I was like, wasn't your part. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the devil. I know. It's like, okay. Oh, <laughs> you gosh. You were a Catholic, though, right? Because I was like, I- of course I did. And in fact, we were joking because it was on the other day. And my kids, like, we, we had to put it on. And it's, you know, it's the part where the spell has been cast. And, you know, and I remember I had gone through a lot of, like, the, the pro- like, it, it's it's really that, the, that you know, it, it, she becomes so pathetic and it's public and it's Laura Lizzie is, is, you know, finishing up a swim practice and takes her bathing cap off and, and the girls have cast a spell that she's going to lose her hair and get scabs. And it was a big prosthetic makeup and it was a long, like several hours. And, and, and of course my kids go walk in at that part. And my mom, the Catholic, she goes, Oh, I didn't like this movie. I didn't, did not like this movie. <laughs> I was like, yeah, mom, it really wasn't your demo. It really wasn't made. <laughs> right, it wasn't made for, for you. <laughs> for the, the yeah, church going Catholic moms. It I, was really yeah. for kids and it it's, was cool. And people love it. Like, I love that I was defending it too. At that point, it was kind of prestigious to be in studio movies. Like, you know, I did a ton of indies too, but it felt good to book a studio movie. Does that? It you, did. You, Felt good to your bank account to book a studio movie. Heck <laughs> yeah. Oh, my exactly. God. Exactly. That's what I really mean here, people. <laughs> but then you did another cult classic movie with Dave Chappelle about <laughs> a, a group of stoner guys 
Uh, you can say the name if you want, but uh, <laughs> you play a girl ironically named Mary Jane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and just for our for our listeners, the scene that I just watched is Dave Chappelle has no money and okay. desperately wants to take you out on a date. So he keeps offering things that cost no money. You want to go on a walk? Yeah. And she she yeah, wants yeah, to go. Yeah. She wants to go to a restaurant. He goes, "How about we get a hot dog?" You know, and they like, have yeah. a, a dollar thing. Every time he spends a little bit of money, the gr- the the gr- you know the graph on the screen is like his yeah, money. Goes. How much money he's spending? <laughs> right. And then you're like, "Can we take a cab?" And we don't, I, it, the two of you together were so classic. And he looks he was like a skinny guy you know now he's like ripped you know and he's the biggest comedian in the world but what was that experience like for you because that that movie's cult oh super fun and here's i don't even know if this is still valid today for young for actors out there but you know i got cast in that because i they asked me to come in i just went in once and read with dave who was super sweet so great we you know just see our chemistry just once that's it with him but another actress who had been in some big movies who was kind of my type or whatever, black, um, she was like, no, I won't come in and read. And not that it really matters. It's a dumb movie, right? I, I'm sure she doesn't care that she wasn't in it, but it was like a good lesson in like, oh, I was willing to come in and do a, a chemistry test because who, who was I anyway to be like, no, <laughs> to be honest. But those are hard. I mean, those like to me, if if a, if someone's asking you to come in to see you with a person like I, I mean, I, That's listen, what we do. I, I'm I'm married to a director who I know even if he's seen work, it's and not everyone has to audition for everything. But there are times where he's like, I just want to see the chemistry with the two of yeah. them. And it's not it's not for lack of their talent or their resume or right. it's not or it's ego, not an which- ego. It's right. ego. It's ego. Yes. Right. It, it is ego. But then again, when I think about times like, you know, TV shows, I'd be like, I don't I offer only on like the Jamaican store clerk roles. For I God's mean, sake. Yeah, no, we, we all oh, got to that different. part yeah. where we yeah. had earned that yeah. ability. And yeah. I was so proud of being able to say, um, no, I will not. Yeah. Audition you know what I'm saying? You the girl those... who walks by in the tight dress or whatever. Right. You exactly. earn those moments as well. <laughs> by the way, that that movie still lives on today. My my son loves that movie. <laughs> How old are your children? You guys look like your baby. He's 18. Shut yeah. up. Really? Yeah. I have a cat. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Enjoy your kitty cat. Uh, so it was so I, I love that I got it because A, my friends were, listen, my friends were all making fun of me. They were like, How are you going to pretend you don't like weed, Rachel? Because it's, Mary Jane is really uh-huh. anti weed. In the movie, she's like, it's a gateway drug. My father's in prison because of weed. She's really like a type A Capricorn, like so different, you know, like different than me, actually. She's very (laughs) Virgo, like, I'm going to get the stun. So. um, And Dave Chappelle plays an enormous stoner who's now having to pretend he doesn't smoke. Everyone else in the movie (laughs) is an enormous stoner, except for my character. Like Chong, Tommy Chong is in it, I think, is my dad. And, um, you know, stoner, stoner, stoner. We shot it in Toronto, which I was like, why America so messed up? We can't ever shoot in our own cities. Like, even then, I thought <laughs> it's supposed to be New York. Oh, it looked shooting- like New York. Wow. I, that's surprising. We shot one day in New York. But I think shooting in New York is super brutal or was then. So um, super fun. First of all, Christine, have you ever been the only chick basically in a movie? Of course, it's the best. <laughs> it was it's really the great. best. And I, I listen. I'm a girl's girl. I love my friends. Like we got, you know, I can't exist without my my friends. Um, as we always say, like we yeah. don't talk shit about our friends. We throw roses at our friends' backs when they're not around. So my <laughs> friends are super important. That said, it was kind of the easiest job I've ever had because there was no. What is your costume and what are you? Do you know all the stuff that happens on sets or how many lines do you? There was none of that. Right. No competition. No, <laughs> no competition. Ha- you got to be the girl. Do and your like, thing. Yeah. Laura Silverman was in it, um, but she wasn't there the whole time. She was only in for a couple of days. So it really just was me and a bunch of boys who all had significant others or whatever. So I was really like their sister, which was even more fun than like one guy pressuring you to sleep with them. You know what I mean? Like the whole <laughs> thing. 
<laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yes, Christine, I think that I think you do. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, you're special. If you're one of the only girls in an all male cast, yeah, the, you're, you're the you're the the princess. You're the queen. You know, yes. right? You're the only girl, so you're the only boobs they can look at. So they're like, hey, <laughs> uh, you said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> Going back to that first Chris Rock experience, were you oh like did you always find yourself funny? Did you feel intimidated? Because like, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, working with comics Seriously, two of, of the that greatest caliber. of all time. Because I had moments with when I've worked with like I mean, even working with Ben at the beginning and like Will Ferrell and oh, and like those guys, it was like another league <laughs> that I was. And a lot of times I just got to play the straight person in many of them. But I it was almost like watching something like I was a sort of a spectator watching the the comedic brilliance. Watching How was that for you? Yeah. Unfold. I mean, to be honest, I've been the straight girl in all the movies. <laughs> it's here to be to be a lady. I'm a girl, you guys. That might as well have been all my lines. I'm a girl. You know. But you have to know comedy to be the straight one because I think you have to know how to oh, react. Yeah. You Sometimes have to that's know harder. how to not. Yes, exactly. No, and listen, I, I mentioned it before, but I ended up on a sitcom, right, at, called Half and Half. <laughs> not half baked, <laughs> half and a half. Right. And um, I was number was number one on the call sheet. And we all know as actors, that's kind of fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want to be number one on the call sheet. I was a straight person. Everything happened around me. <laughs> that's you. That sometimes can be on a sitcom the most boring character. I, I, mean, <laughs> I think I have. I do feel. I don't think I was funny as a kid necessarily, but I've always been. You know, in my household, wit was being quick witted and intelligent and smart was the most important thing. So I think the humor, you know, anyone who's quick witted, I think, can be kind of funny. Right. So I think I always had that. And then I found ways with that sitcom to, like, make her more funny. But after a while, I mean, you guys have you've done much more comedy, Christine, <laughs> you know, so I just was like, just say the line. Yeah. Yeah. Just say the line. <laughs> just, don't overthink it. Just stay the line. Don't make a meal of it. Right. Just. Don't make a meal of it because because the truth is for me on a sitcom, every Sunday night before the Monday table read, I would get it. And I honestly, and I'm not speaking specifically of my sitcom. It was very funny and cute. But any sitcom I'd be like that I was ever on, I was like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't I don't get What's where are the, the jokes? jokes? Where are the, the jokes? jokes? I don't see the jokes. I know they're supposed to be one every third line. So I'm going to assume that's a joke until I realized it was situational. Right. Most of the comedy. So it's not even the line is funny. It's the situation that makes the line. I had to, you know, learn kind of on my footing on that particular sitcom. And they were like, well, we only cast you because you were so weird and different from everyone else. And I was like, OK. Uh, well, also, I, you you are stood toe to toe and see, were a great scene partner for Dave Chappelle, for Chris Rock. You you know, you knew comedy. No, I'm no, sorry. For you, sure. And I think timing, like you can't buy timing, right? Like true. you know when to come in with the line or, or stretch out the tension a little bit and drop yep. the line. Then that's true. I think it's it's those things can't be taught. You either kind of have maybe they can, but. I feel like most people I know, they were innately that and then they did, honed it and developed it in classes, but they had it in them. Um, so I love comedy, actually. I thought it was so fun to make people laugh. Don't you, Christine? Like yes, yes. <laughs> I think there's nothing better. It can be very scary because you feel really if it's we've all said like, it, especially in those situation comedies where if the joke doesn't land and it. Multiple, wah, wah. And you know it should should be, and it's not. Then it's gone. But um, yeah, it's a. I I do. I love. I I mean, to me, that's the best. It's the 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 laughing and the and it's harder. I, I <laughs> it's you know, harder. there's the what is it? Hitchcock who said, "Dying is easy, comedy is hard." There's if you're a great comedic <laughs> actor or actress, you can you can breeze through a drama, whether it's Adam Sandler or John C. Riley. You know, you you're Steve Carell. You pivot yeah. to drama very, but you can't take a dramatic actor and, and say, "Oh, they're definitely going to nail a comedy." No way. That's that's very true, actually. Although yeah. I will say the one nut I've never been able to crack, and I bet you both are amazing at this, Christine and David. Procedurals. I literally look at the typeface and I'm like, ah! 
I d- well, I don't think I've ever. I mean, I think I guest starred on one, and I don't. It just I never get them. I've I think I over look, the years I've auditioned for all of them. Me too. I I just don't get those shows. I don't look good in the cop uniform. All of it. No. Like, I, like, yes, or just I the suit. Nail it. The suit where you're just wearing the suit carrying lawyers. I've okay. never done one. No, they've because, never asked me. Me neither. <laughs> it, it's it's not about it's a, passing. It's not. It, they just w- weren't asking. I think it's a certain skill set for procedural stuff because I see those people who are, excel at procedurals. They don't always excel at like a sitcom. You're like right. we were saying, it's it's yes. a different skill set. So in the end, also I loved being on a like in the nineties. Remember how you're doing TV? <laughs> like TV was so cool in the nineties. I love being a movie actor. Here's where my how do you go is a use. Mm-hmm. I'm a movie actor. You and now, and now it's flip flopped. <laughs> it's it, completely flip flopped. So when I got that show in the early aughts, I loved doing it because um first of all, uh just having somewhere to go every week instead of two months or three months or two weeks or a week or whatever and um and then developing character over the course of time years yes. was yes. super exciting i'd never had that luxury before and then it's true you do kind of know your character inside and out uh and you see them grow you know yes. so all of that was really fun so great Bef- all right we, we can't keep you for too much longer but i want to hear t- just quickly tell us about your first book and then the second the one you're writing right now oh uh the first one is a tarot book in deck set um again it's Jungian psychology based tarot it is literally designed to feel like a, a friend the deck i designed with an artist to for a major publisher um to feel like a close friend something warm and soothing because there's some decks that are like you're dead and i was like no i don't want oh, that oh gosh you <laughs> no, can't no, tell please. someone <laughs> oh <laughs> i want really friendly and then the book is a whole book that i wrote all by my big girl self and that was hard christina and david i don't think i'd written over 20 pages in since high school since college you know? yeah but i since college but i love writing i love words and it you know it took me a while to figure out how to get the words to lay on the page the way i wanted them to because i thought oh i can i'm a good orator i can just speak it no it's a book so all of that was a really great exercise and then included in that tarot book and deck set there's 22 to go along with the 22 first cards memory episodes where i talk about a lot of the stuff we're talking about now um, just my life as a, you know, Gen X person in New York in the early nineties and then in LA and then a l- some from my current life and things like that. So it was a really fun project. And then this book is a book of essays, um, basically for highly, there's, you know, a lot of young girls come up to me. You probably get the kids too, cause you look really young. So they're like, let's hang out. And I'm like, I'm about to kill <laughs> over. I'm like, I can't do no, but they'll say to me, like, they'll come up and they'll go, I'm an empath. I'm very sensitive. What do I do? I'm so special. And I'm like, okay, yes, but no. So part of the book, <laughs> it's just like, again, Christine, you have children. And, and, and I think a lot of the girls come up and they're like, all oh, my power is based in my sex. And I'm like, no, yes, but no, you know. Yeah, there's so, something young. About, it's great because they know they yes, have their power the way absolutely. I don't think we did, and they, they, it's, absolutely. But, but it's, but it's what, what is it really? Well, this is other, great. Well, I'm like, listen, everyone, almost everyone has that, so that can't be the thing that makes you special, right? right. So this is a book of essays, more about just how to how to not be overwhelmed, and it's not like I'm a psychologist. It's just I have a lot of. You know, it's just life experience, life experience, things I've been through and how I comforted myself and maybe some and, you know, talking about tra- TM meditation and just different things uh, Beautiful. That, I've done, that I've done to stay sane. You know, I love it. I sounds love like it, it. it help a lot of people, too. It sounds amazing. It's just something to do. You know, like you said, there's a strike on now. I'm very lucky I sold this book because with a nonfiction book, you sell a proposal and then you write mm-hmm. the book. So they pay you a little up front. So I was like, oh, that's nice have a little money coming in from the book can write out this strike uh which i'm very much for obviously yes yes you know yes. my sitcom streams on netflix and five other platforms and i don't make enough in the total year i think for one month of bills so we all know these stories and um, i think it's good that we're striking right now i really hope we get some um some you know i really hope we move ahead because i read last night like this lawyer said you know um 
the apartment I lived in when I was 18, right? It was $800. He's like, and now it's 4,000. I today could not afford to live in the apartment of my youth. So I'm hoping some of these things change because I'm worried that, you know, it's going to become a little like England where there we don't have a middle class and then there will be no middle class actors. It will only be people who have are subsidized by their families. I'm just worried that it'll just become the sport of the wealthy. And I think, um, you know, actors, we've always been show folk and diversity is what makes us thrive as actors. And I don't mean color. I just mean diversity of people. Yeah. Back- Economic yes. background. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. of it. We're with you. All of it. I, I'm so happy to meet you. This has been Thank am- you amazing. Thank you so much. Please, let's, I want to find you. I want to stay in touch. I want to see you. We're in New York. You're in LA, but you're yes. in New York. Yes. Do you love it? I'm so, I, I want do. to move back so much. I spent all last summer working on a TV show and I really want to move back. Oh, well, please, let's please stay in, let's find each other, please, I'll find and you stay on in Instagram, touch. Instagram, maybe. I'm sure you're yes. six million people, but maybe you'll see I my don't. Message. I don't. Um, I, I, as David knows, I have a little private account, so I, oh, I'll do? text you all the info. I'll okay. Yeah. The yeah, info. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll call, I'll, I'll get you and we'll find each other. I appreciate you guys inviting me on. Oh, we loved it. We Thanks loved it. I'm so us. happy to reconnect. Yeah, me too. Me too. And again, how does she look like you're, you look like a baby. You like look baby. like that. Okay. You right. look like that. Goodbye. Bye, <laughs> Bye Rachel. Love. Bye, guys. Hey. Amazing. You got so good friends. So fun. So fun. I mean, really, it was not, I did not get to know her that well during the during the film, but I just always had this connection because, you know, we had these tough scenes to do together. And it was, um, it was a big deal, like doing that movie. I remember it was a big deal for me because I was playing not the, you know, the kind of characters I usually played. And I, you know, anyway, um, that was really cool. What an interesting person. Again, like just I love that what she's doing what, during the strike and writing. And um, yeah, really, really great. And I hope so, our, um, our, our fans out there who have been wanting a... Uh, a fellow castmate from our witch movie <laughs> enjoyed it. Yeah, she's done. Yeah, she, she's done some movies that are st- still like you call them cult classics, but like our kids watch them, and she's amazing. She can do drama, comedy, and just a spiritual sweet, sweet girl. Really that cool. was awesome. I enjoyed really it. Cool. Thank you yes. for getting her. Yes, um, and thanks everybody. We will uh, we'll be back uh, next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Hold on to summer. It's not over yet. It's not over. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Christine. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe and give us five stars. And please follow us on Instagram at HeyDude, the 90s called. See you next time.